Hello, welcome. My name is Elizabeth Coleman. I'm a teaching artist at Northern Clay Center, and we have recorded some lectures that I gave about a decade ago um, at Florida Atlantic University on ceramic art history. If you are having students or if you yourself want to read some background material for additional images and context, the readings for this course came from um, 10,000 Years of Pottery by Emmanuel Cooper, and then Clay from Susan Staubach, and the reading pages are listed above. I'd also ask them to look up the knock culture. If you don't want to have the readings be part of it, please start with the next image. Our topic today is the great age of Greek ceramics from 1000 to 200 BCE. At the same time, I want to acknowledge that there were many other cultures with pottery traditions around the world. Greek ceramics has been studied the most um, by art historians and we, we have the most information from them. So they tend to be privileged in ceramic art histories. In South America, we're gonna take a brief look at the pottery of the Northern and Central Andes cultures. Eastern Asia, we've got the Qin Dynasty and then the Jomon sculptures from China. In Central Asia, Assyrian pottery and Babylonian architecture. In Europe, Greek Empire pottery and sculpture, the Etruscan culture and architecture, pottery and sculpture. And then a brief look at the sculpture of the Nak culture in Africa. This spouted bottle on the screen is in the form of a squash and it's typical of career ceramics, which is in um, an area now known as Ecuador. It's an idealized depiction of the vegetable, demonstrating a high level of technical mastery. The work exhibits thin walled construction and burnished surfaces that are simple and elegant shapes with forms taken from the flora and fauna of the natural world. The vertical ridges of the squash depicted here have been rendered clearly, thereby making the body of the vessel a collection of abstract ridges and curves. So the burnished surface of the bottle achieved by polishing with a rock or shell before firing shines and is reminiscent of the skin of a squash. Also in this area, archaeologists have found pottery such as the figure vessel on the left and the shallow bowl on the right. Human figures are represented by the Korira people with rounded full volume forms with a minimum of anatomical detail. This figure lies on its back, fat arms at its side with short legs extended and it has a large round opening in its stomach. The pierced earlobes common on many Ecuadorian figures may have once held ornaments. The genderless body is decorated with incised lines, perhaps indicating a textile pattern. On the right, the shallow rounded bottom bowl has an elongated shape with elegantly curved walls that are beveled along the top and rise gently to a point in the center of the long sides while the short sides are slightly concave. Inside on the short sides, a small monkey, it's really, you have to kind of zoom in to see it. There's a small monkey that clings to the rim. Its three-dimensional rounded head is thrown back. Two frightened wide open eyes stare at the viewer. The animal's arms and legs and its long curled tail are worked in relief. The bowl is surfaced with red slip and burnished to a gloss. Incised geometric designs embellish the inner surface of the dish. In Peru, or what is now Peru, 
between the 12th and the 5th centuries, we've found a number of bottles that are called stirrup vessels. These were made in northern South America beginning in the second millennium. And the shape is visually reminiscent of the stirrup on a horse's saddle. So that's where the term stirrup bottle comes from. These were particularly favored in Peru, where for thousands of years they were made in a great variety of shapes, sizes, and finishes. So stirrup spout bottles, such as this example on the left, termed Cuspanique, after the location in which many vessels in the style were initially discovered, are robustly sculptural and often monochrome in color. Strong and squat in shape, this bottle has a particularly well-balanced surface with carefully placed raised projections and round protrusions that echo the curved forms of the body and the spout. On the right, we have another stirrup spouted bottle on this burnished blackware vessel, a small naturally, naturalistically rendered deer is being carried on the broad shoulders of a heavy seated man. His hands hold the front and hind legs of the animal. His face bears incised geometric designs, perhaps representing facial paint, tattoos, or scarification practiced in ancient times. These pots were found in tombs and probably held food and drink believed necessary to nourish the dead. The bottles depicted here are also from Peru. They're examples of bottles with different spout shapes than the stirrup shape. Bottles were used as important mortuary offerings in ancient Peru for thousands of years. Early northern coast vessels are fired to muted tones of gray, black, and tan, and have well-finished surfaces that could be highly polished or textured, or a combination of the both, as is demonstrated in both of these here. This impressive bottle on the left with its well-preserved surface slip painting came from an ancient burial site on Peru's north coast. On its front, a large incised and mottled feline head in profile looks upward. Its long stylized snout is studded with teeth and ends in a curled nose. The looped tongue projects from the mouth and extends beyond the shoulder of the chamber. A half closed eye appears under the bulging brow. A smaller fanged profile head opposite may be that of a snake. Its scaly body shown as a series of adjoining hook shapes along the sides and bottom of the vessel. Similar shapes appear on the back of this vessel. Circular pelt markings suggest that a jaguar is depicted. On the right is a whistling bottle with a feline face. This is a double spouted form with a bridge Often the spout is modeled as a standard stylized bird head as here, which functions as a whistle producing a gentle sound when the liquid inside the bottle is poured out. The impressive frontal face of a snarling feline decorates the side of the vessel chamber directly under the whistle spout. The creature's features are geometricized into a series of parallel bands filled in with red and white resin paint. Applied after firing, most of the paint is now missing. So we know that the Peruvian cultures of this time were using slips to decorate, but their firing method did not make things impervious to liquids. So they were pouring resin to line the interior and then also probably using resin-based paints in places on the exterior. In China, we have the Qin Dynasty, circa 220 to 200 BCE. Previously a minor state in the Northwest, Qin had seized the territories of small states on its south and west borders by the mid third century. Soon thereafter, Ying Zhen, who would reunite China, came to the 
chin throne as a boy of nine. He captured the remaining six of the, quote, warring states, end quote, expanding his rule eastward and as far south as the Yangtze River. He proclaimed himself the first emperor of the Qin, or Qin Shu Wandi. The, the word Qin is the source of the Western name China. Throughout his rule, Qin Shu Wandi cons continued to extend the empire, eventually reaching as far south as Vietnam. Excavations begun in 1974 brought to light over 7,000 larger than life size fired terracotta statues of soldiers and 2,000 fired clay statues of larger than life size horses. This is a vast army guarding the tomb of Chinchuandi. Work on his tomb and terracotta army began almost as soon as he gained power and continued for 38 years after his death. During this time, where the Qin were practicing what's called substitution burial. So instead of having all of his servants and house people and soldiers um, entombed with him, there were substitutions made of clay and these are life size. The soldiers have solid legs and abdomens. The upper torsos were coil built and modeled and are hollow. The heads also hollow were press molded and modeled. Each of the 7,000 soldiers has a different highly expressive face. Indeed, they represent the features of men from the various provinces of China. Their construction methods were extremely skilled. The feet, legs, and lower bodies of the 2,000 horses were modeled from a solid chunk of clay. The rest of the body was coil built and hollow. The head, ears, and manes were attached while the clay was still soft, and vent holes were cut into the horses' bodies to prevent explosions in the kiln. The, the terracotta army and Chinchurwandi's burial site has been described by art historians as mind-boggling. Each of the pieces is not only large, which requires great technical virtuosity, both in the building and the firing, but each piece was also made with careful attention to the tiniest details. The underside of an archer's shoe has tread. The warrior's belts have perfectly represented buckles and the clothes have folds. Nothing is left to the imagination. It's all there, sculpted in clay, and then buried for thousands of years with the emperor. The excavated parts of the army now reside under um, airplane hangar type building. There were three massive pits that have been found and excavated and preserved. A fourth pit was not ever finished and didn't receive horses or soldiers. The Terracotta Army is one of the top cultural destinations in the world. In Japan, the Jomon culture is still going strong. Sculptures are found were found in shell middens, but also in burial sites. The small figurine on the left is an example of a clay figure called a dogu, which was modeled in human and animal forms, and they were made throughout Japan's sculptural tradition. The largest percentage of these figures, including this statuette from Northern Honshu, consist of highly stylized images of females with enlarged breasts, stomachs, and hips, presumed to have been fertility symbols. Because these figures were usually broken intentionally, it's supposed that they were used as part of rituals meant to cure physical ailments. It seems that once the affliction was ceremonially transferred to the figure, the clay image was discarded. This speculation explains the evidence that most dogu are found scattered about or in refuse heaps. On the right, we have a shard that's a bust of a female figure. 
These figures have large bisected coffee bean shaped eyes and the true meaning of this convention remains unknown. The nose and mouth are merely suggested by small holes. A crown sits atop the figure's head and her body is decorated with deeply incised lines and areas impressed with cord markings that may represent tattoos. In Mesopotamia, specifically Babylon, um, Babylon was the largest city in the world from 1770 to 1670 BCE. And then again between 612 and 320 BCE. It was perhaps the first city to reach a population above 200,000 in 614 BC. During the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II, the Neo-Babylonian Empire reached its peak. That was around 600 BCE. During this period, Babylon became the city of splendor de described by Herodotus in the Old Testament book of Daniel. Because stone is rare in southern Mesopotamia, molded and lead glazed bricks were used for buildings, transforming Babylon into a city of brilliant color. Relief figures in white, black, blue, red, and yellow decorated the city's gates and buildings. This is called the gate of Ishtar, the blue in the front. Here's a close-up of it as it appears in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. This is a reconstruction or an image of a reconstruction of the Ishtar gate. And this is a, a lead that by this point, the Mesopotamians have figured out lead-based glaze. So that blue is cobalt and lead. And then the light blue over to the right would be copper with lead glaze. Lions decorated the processional street, the most important street in Babylon that led from the inner city through the Ishtar gate to the house of the New Year's festival. North of the gate, the roadway was lined with glazed figures of striding lions. This relief of a lion, the animal associated with Ishtar, goddess of love and war, served to protect the street. Its repeated design served as a guide for the ritual processions from the city to the temple. Here we've got a better example of the copper-based glaze there in the center surrounding the lions. And you can also see the red-ish of the brick in some rows. We're gonna move to the Mediterranean and um, to our main topic for today, the Greek pottery. This is an image or a map of the Athenian Empire at its height at about 450 BC. Greece became the Mediterranean center of ceramics around the year 1000 BCE. Major shapes used by the Greeks developed very early and with minor variations continued to be made for nearly a thousand years. Most were designed to hold some kind of liquid for daily use as well as for ceremonial occasions and burial of the dead. Greek wares were relied upon a few standard shapes, a crisp, clean surface, and subdued color patterns. The painted designs, on the other hand, are often of extraordinary ambition in detail and composition, meant to be recognized and understood by the viewers as dramatic episodes from family stories. They draw upon a shared culture of myth and symbol. The two great centers of decorated ceramics were Athens and Corinth. Athens, or as we refer to it sometimes, Attic pottery. Athens clay was dug from the borders of the city and fired a rich red, while the yellowish clays in Corinth were lighter in color. The Greeks were using a relatively fast wheel, carefully prepared clay, and a fine particle slip for decoration. 
More ordinary vessels were also made at many places within Greece itself, the Greek islands, notably Rhodes and Cyprus, and Greek settlements in Asia Minor. Greek colonies in Italy and Sicily imported and later also produced pottery. So Greek pots have been found in Syria, Egypt, southern Russia, and northern Italy, testifying to their great popularity during this time period. The most common Greek vessel is the amphora depicted in the top left. It's a storage jar with a clearly articulated foot, rounded body, a lip, and two curved handles. The crater below it, there's a calyx crater, a column crater, a bell crater, a volute crater. Craters were used for mixing wine and water. They're broader and heavier with a large opening with two handles, while the hydria has three handles. It's a little bit, it's below the bell crater. Hydria has three handles and was used for holding water. A shape found only in the Greek world is the kylix in the bottom left and then next to it, the stemless kylix. It's a low profile cup with a raised foot sometimes and two handles that was used for drinking wine. A particularly fine form is that of the oinocho with its bulbous body and curved handle. It was used for pouring liquids. The pikesis, a rounded jar, was used to hold cosmetics and trinkets. Perhaps the most elegant shape of all was the lekythos, a tall bottle intended for holding oil. This crater is from the geometric period of Greek pottery from Athens. During the geometric period, monumental grave markers were introduced in the form of large vases, often decorated with funerary representations. On this magnificent crater, the main scene, which occupies the widest portion of the vase, shows the prothesis, a ritual in ancient Greek funerary practice in which the deceased is laid out on a high bed, usually within the house. During the prosthesis, relatives and friends may come to mourn and pay their respects to the deceased. So these craters were used not only to mix water and wine, but also for grave markers. For optimal clarity, the deceased is shown on his side. It's kind of hard to see, there's a glare there, but the, they, they haven't um, developed perspective yet. So bodies are turned forward rather than lying on their side. The checkered shroud that would normally cover the body has been raised and regularized into a long rectangle. The figures on either side are depicted with triangle chests shown frontally and breasts in profile. The figures legs and circle, circular heads are also rented in profile. A meander pattern delineates the neck from the body of the vessel. And the meander pattern is the one that kind of looks like a labyrinth. This vase represents the geometric style, which takes its name from the geometric shapes that constitute its artistic language. And this is from the second half of the eighth century. If you listened to the previous lecture about Minoan and Mycenaean pottery, this piece will look pretty familiar. But by now the Greeks have conquered Cyprus and this is a jug found on that island. During the 8th century BCE, the geometric style that had originated in Athens spread through the Greek-speaking world. This zoomorphic vessel shows the increasing skill of the potters of the Mediterranean. Wheel thrown from parts and then assembled, this jug has a spout modeled in the form of a griffin's head. A griffin is the body of a lion and the head and wings of an eagle. The griffin's head has a ferocious beak serving as the pouring spout. 
showing the influences of both pre-geometric Greek pottery and design elements of Middle Eastern pottery. This pot literally sits astride the trade routes of the ancient Mediterranean. Zoomorphism refers to the use of motifs combined from different animals to create a never before seen creature, often representing a deity. As I said, the griffin is a mythological winged monster with an eagle-like head and the body of a lion. Its precise meaning remains unknown, but it originated in the Middle East around 2000 BCE. Finely thrown, burnished and painted with iron slip, the decoration shows a grazing horse on one panel and a lion killing a stag in the other. An early representation of the meander pattern is evident in the panel at mid-left as well. Late geometric period is exemplified by this vase, which I'm showing two views of. This is an anek amphora found in Athens. This tall, wide-mouthed amphora represents the fully developed geometric style and illustrates the profoundly significant shift of focus from abstract design to the human figure. Decorative bands consisting of a zigzag, cross-hatching, and dots fill the area above and below the two main figural scenes. On each side of the amphora's neck is a warrior with a round shield poised between two horses. A long-legged bird stands beneath each horse. Five two-horse chariots with charioteers parade around the belly of the vessel. Each driver wears a long robe and holds four reins, signifying that two horses, not one, pull each chariot. Anatomical details of the warriors, charioteers, and horses have been reduced to simple geometric shapes. Characteristically, the heads are rendered in profile and the bodies in three-quarter view. Armed warriors, chariots, and horses are the most familiar iconography of the geometric period. Whether these images reflect a real world of military threat and conflict or refer to the heroic deeds of ancestors is a long-standing debate in studies of geometric art. This dinos, or mixing bowl, is attributed to the Corinthian painter Polytelia. Corinthian artists, remember, have a yellow firing clay, and they invented a style of silhouetted forms that focused on tapestry-like patterns of small animals and plant motifs. The finest vases from the region of Corinth are, de are generally datable to the 7th century BCE. This dinos, a bowl for mixing of wine and water, is decorated with panthers, sphinxes, goats, and lions. This lekythos from 550 BCE, roughly, is from the archaic period of Greek pottery. So we've moved from the geometric to what they call the archaic. It's also called black figure wear. Athenian potters took the Corinthian idea of silhouetted forms, but used it with mythological scenes or to depict special occasions. The scene that decorates the body of this small lekythos or oil flask is our earliest and most complete representation of an Attic wedding or an Athenian wedding. The bridal procession, the critical point of passage between the bride's home and that of the groom, was the most conspicuous public part of a wedding ceremony in ancient Athens. Torches and songs added to the festival occasion when the bride's mother, torch in hand, led the couple to their new home. In black figure vase painting, figural and ornamental motifs were applied with a slip that turned black during firing, while the background was left the color of the red clay of Athens. Base painters articulated individual forms by incising the slip or by adding white and purple enhancements. This is a, a panatheic amphora that would have been filled with oil from the sacred groves in Attica and was used as a prize for some worthy victor in one of the panatheniac games held in Athens every four years. 
With its typically fat body and small neck and foot, the prize vase is perhaps the best example of a vase shape made to serve an official function. Each pan athenyak amphora was made according to a standardized shape and capacity so that it could hold 42 quarts of olive oil. It was decorated with the black figure technique. The principal decoration is always in the panels of the body of the amphora, with an armed Athenian typically on the front and an illustration of the featured competition on the back. So we're looking at the back side here. The painter of this vessel has neatly fit five sprinters into the panel of the pot. Notice the wealth of incised lines depicting the musculature, a, pre a preoccupation of Greek artists for centuries to come. The finest of all Athenian artists of the archaic period, Exochias signed many of his vessels as both potter and painter. He took his subjects from Greek mythology, which he and his patrons probably considered history, such as the hero Achilles and the story of the Trojan War. On the body of this amphora, he painted Achilles and his cousin Ajax, a fellow warrior, playing a game of dice. The owner of the amphora knew the story, what had happened and what would happen next. Achilles, sulking over an insult, has refused to fight but eventually returns to battle and is killed. The two men bend over a game board in rapt concentration, wearing their body armor and holding their spears, but setting aside their shields. At the moment, Achilles is dominant. He wears the helmet and is winning the game. After the battle, Ajax will carry Achilles' lifeless body from the field. Exochia skillfully matches his painting to the shape of the vase. The triangular shape formed by the two men rises to the mouth of the jar, while the handles continue the line of their shields. Exochias is a skilled potter and also a skilled draftsman. He captures both form and emotion, balancing areas of black against finely engraved patterns. For example, the hero's cloaks and silhouetted figures. The red figure period followed in around 450 BCE and is considered the high classical or classical period of Greek ceramics. This stamnos with lid is attributed to Menelaos, the Menelaos painter. In reg figure designs, the decorative motifs remain the color of the clay, the background filled in with slip turned black in the firing. Figures could be articulated with slip lines or dilute washes of slip applied with a brush for shading. The use of a brush in red figure technique was better suited to the naturalistic expression developing at the time in representations of anatomy, garments, and emotions. The firing process of both red and black figure vessels consisted of three stages. During the first oxidizing stage, air was allowed into the kiln, turning the whole vase the color of the clay, which in this case was red. In the subsequent stage, green wood was introduced into the chamber and the oxygen supply was reduced, causing the pot to turn black in the smoky environment. In the third stage, air was reintroduced into the kiln. The slipped portions remained black while the non-slipped parts of the object turned back to orange and red. So a very tricky and complicated firing process. Another example of the red figure technique is on the left, this lekythos or um, oil bottle depicts a single figure decorating the elongated body of the small red figure flask. The young woman plays the alos, a double reed wind instrument. On the right, we have another lekythos that's been titled Bringing Gifts for a Dead Woman. This is from the late classical period, and they were using a white slip in the center, so it's also sometimes called the white ground period. The scene on the right depicts 
real life funerary practices in late fifth century Adam, Athens. In particular, that of family members or friends visiting the tomb and laying offerings there. Such a scene is especially appropriate for the decoration of a white ground lekythos as these vases are only found in or above graves. They contained a perfumed oil which was offered either to the dead or to the gods of the underworld. In the white figure technique, artists enhanced the fired vessel with a full range of colors painted over the white ground. They were using tempera, an opaque white based medium mixed with glue or egg white. The figures in this scene are drawn in matte gray outlines with added washes of color. This fragile decoration deteriorated easily and for that reason seems to have been favored only for funerary, votive and other non-utilitarian vessels. Clay sculpture of this time was very tiny. Um, the statuette on the left is seven and a half inches tall. During the fourth century, small ceramic sculptures known as Tanagra figures became popular. They were found by the thousands in grave sites at Tanagra in Boeotia, but they were also made in Athens. Their purpose is not known with certainty, but since many have appeared in tombs, we speculate that they had funerary function. Made from molds, the figures are hollow and some were modified into vessels. They were brightly colored with water soluble paints. On the left figure, we see still the red pigment used for her hair. Black pigment would have originally marked her eyebrows, eyes and other details. Still evident on the surface of, her dra of the drapery are the original white slip and traces of blue pigment, an expensive paint applied only sparingly on Tanagra figures. The figure on the left is one that was found by the thousands and that we believe was molded. The one on the right from late fourth century BC is an 18 and a half inch terracotta sculpture that appears to have been hand built and we've only found this one. It's a depiction of Aphrodite amusing arrows and is unique in the collection of classical terracottas. This sculpture illustrates a tendency toward genre sculpture which was characteristic of Hellenistic art. The paint is so well preserved that we can easily imagine how this piece must have looked originally. We're gonna move now to a Greek colony in Italy called Etruria. This is a distinctive hydra found in Etruria that's believed to be produced by East Greek craftsmen who had emigrated to Caer, an Etruscan city on the Italian coast north of Rome. Here, two felines attacking a bull are surrounded by beautifully drawn ivory wreaths. Italy also has a very rich ceramics tradition. Fabulous pottery was made there by the Etruscans, who flourished in central and northern Italy during the 9th and 8th centuries BCE. There was a lot of intermingling between the Etruscans and the Greek artists that immigrated to Etruria. Some scholars believe Etruscans emigrated from Western Asia, others that they were Indo-Europeans that had come from the north, and still others believe that they were indigenous to Italy. And we've never deciphered their language, so it's hard to solve that debate. Between the 7th and 6th centuries BCE, the Etruscans gained control of the north and much of today's central Italy. Etruscan artists knew of and drew inspiration from Greek and Near Eastern sources. They assimilated these influences with their own inventive and artistic vitality. Organized into a loose federation of a dozen cities, the Etruscans reached the height of their political power in 6th century BCE. They were also known for the pieces depicted 
here called Buchero ware. So in addition to producing wares in the style of Greek black figure ware, they produced Buchero ware. On the left, a small Buchero vase has been variously interpreted as a toy. It's only four and a half inches tall. As a toy, a small jug, or an ink stand. It was used certainly as a container with the, heavy, with the head serving as a cork. The small ring on its back shows that the vessel was either suspended from a hook or carried by rope. The tail of the rooster now missing most likely curved downward to form a third foot. In addition to the decoration incised on the head and body, 26 letters of the Etruscan alphabet are inscribed on the belly of the vessel. On the right is a later 6th century Buchero ware, which began to imitate metalwork in which the Etruscans were immensely skilled. This picture is one of a pair that are 18 inches high. The black on both of these comes from burnishing a high iron fine particle slip and reducing it in the atmosphere of the kiln to turn it black. The Etruscans were also really skilled in architecture and in life-size sculpture. They incorporated Greek deities and heroes into their pantheon. Our knowledge of their temple's appearance comes from the few remaining foundations of Etruscan temples, from ceramic votive models and from the writing of the Roman architect Vitruvius. The image on the left is a model of an Etruscan temple. These temples were built on stone platforms, but their structure was wooden. To protect the wood, builders covered much of the structure with terracotta tiles and decorative elements. They also masked the ends of the roof tiles with terracotta antifixes with human or demon faces. All were painted with blue, purplish, black, and liberal amounts of red. The Etruscan statues show some of the best examples of the energy and excitement that characterize Etruscan art. Bright paint, swelling contours, animated faces, and gestural poses distinguish the statues. The statue at right is a pulu or Apollo, made by the famous Etruscan sculptor named Volca. Notice the rippling folds of his garment and the way that the statue leans forward and appears to be striding. These were often um, at the top of the temples, but they also were on the ground. The Etruscans practiced cremation. The top left is showing an early Iron Age Etruscan cinerary urn. The urn would contain the remains of an adult. The hut-shaped cinerary urn is one of the most typical of the time period 900 to 850 BCE. It represents the home of the deceased. The Etruscans in early and late 6th century BCE made anthropomorphic cinerary urns which featured a realistic likeness of the person whose ashes were held within. Some scholars believe that the sarcophagus of the married couple was also made by the sculptor Volca. It's one of the greatest works of Etruscan sculpture. The sarcophagus depicts the husband and wife on a banquet couch reclining in an affectionate pose. The couple's bodies are vertical and square-shouldered but their hips and legs seem to sink into the couch. Portrait sarcophagi like this one evolved from earlier terracotta cinerary urns with sculpted heads. Rather than seeing a somber memorial to the dead, we find two lovely individuals here. The man once raised a drinking vessel, rendered in sufficient detail to convey hair and clothing styles. These genial hosts with the smooth, conventionalized body forms and faces, their up-tilted almond-shaped eyes and their benign smiles, gesture as if to communicate something important to the living viewer. So these would have been placed in tombs.
The last culture that we'll look at today is the Nok people, or so-called Nok people, named after a tin mining site in the vicinity of the village of Nok near the plateau region of Nigeria. These are light terracotta figures and are evidence of the oldest known figurative sculpture south of the Sahara. Artifacts continue to be unearthed without documentation of the context in which they were buried. A lack of extensive archeological study has severely limited our understanding of these cultures in Africa one of the earliest African centers of ironworking and terracotta figure production, the Nak culture remains an enigma. Most of the sculpture is hollow and coil built, finely worked to a resilient consistency from local clays and gravel. The millennia long endurance of these ancient objects is a testament to the technical ability of their makers. The slip of many knock terracottas has eroded, leaving a grainy pocked exterior that does not reflect their original smooth appearance. Most of the knock sculpture found consists of what appear to be portrait heads and bodies, fragmented and damaged by age. The recovered portions of the sculptures that have survived show that they were sculpted in sitting, standing, and genuflecting postures. The great sophistication of Nak terracottas has led some scholars to believe that an older as yet undiscovered tradition must have preceded Nak terracotta arts. Masterful relics severed from their predecessors and successors by the passage of time, Nak terracottas currently occupy an important but isolated space in the history of African art. Our next lecture, lecture five, will be on the ceramics from the Roman and Chinese empires, covering the years 200 BCE through 500 CE, or of the Common Era. The readings for that lecture are listed here. And thank you so much for joining us. Bye.